campsites are really hard to back into. Now, there's some good ones that you can get into if there's no trees, but especially if you want to be in the woods with lots of trees, those are sometimes hard places to back into. This summer, we went camping in West Virginia at a, a park I'd heard of many, many times, heard about people going to it growing up and never been there. And so you, when you do this, you, you sign up online or you, you register online, reserve your spot online, and you just kind of hope that you'll fit. Like, because it was, I was right on the edge, like the length of the camper and the site, and you just kind of hope. And so we pull in, and it's lots of woods, and you wind around, and, and this is actually the, the spot that we ended up in. It was just a great spot, beautiful, but it was really hard to back that camper in there. And there was space lengthwise to, to pull it off, but you, can, you can't really see, but kind of back there at the road, it was, the road was narrow, and there were trees on both sides, and little signs. And so it wasn't, the camper wasn't the problem, it was my truck, that every time I turned it, like it would kind of, it would almost hit those signs. It took, and this is really frustrating when a husband and wife are doing this, this thing and like, you're trying not to be frustrated with one another. And she was doing, Charles was doing a great job on this one for sure. But uh, it took us a few minutes to get into this one because great campsites are sometimes hard to get into. My favorite campsite of all time is, is this one over in Gatlinburg. You can see that's just beautiful. Um, you may not know this about uh, Tim and Trudy. They owned this campground. This was their campground before they moved to West Tennessee. Um, it's so much prettier in West Tennessee, isn't it? I'm just kidding. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful campground. And this, so we, after we found out that they owned it, we're like, we should go check it out. And boy, this campsite is spectacular. Here's the crazy thing about this particular site. It's tucked back in the corner of this fairly large campground, obviously a great spot. But if I were to try to back into this campsite, I wish I could show you the rest of the campground on my own, I'd never make it. And so what they do is when you arrive at a camp like this campground, they send somebody with you to your campground or to the campsite and they stand right beside your window. And every time this happens, Charlotte like celebrates because she doesn't have to help me back in. And they stand right beside you and help you back in. What's interesting about this site I feel like they put you about 150 feet from the actual campsite and then they, it's your wind between campers and trees and you got the, the creek over there and it's this long process. But here's what's amazing. The person standing right there at your window, he knows exactly what to do. He'll say, half a turn to the left, full circle, all the way to your right. And it's just back and forth, back and forth. And he knows exactly how to get me winding around in there and eventually, and if I had to do it by myself, it would take you probably, at least I'd like to tell myself, I could do it eventually, but boy, it would be really difficult. There are things that in life like this that we think we can do on our own, but the reality is we can't. You got to have some help or you got to have somebody there to guide you back in this camper up. And I think life is a lot like that. And I think our battle with sin is a lot like that. Most of us, I believe, are trying to do what's right. We want to overcome sin in our lives. But I'm guessing for most of it, it's a consistent struggle, isn't it? Whatever your biggest sin struggle or two or three sin struggles are, I'm guessing this morning you haven't just like mastered that yet, right? You're still struggling. It's this ongoing, consistent battle to overcome this sin in your life. And we want to. And the problem is sometimes we think we can do it on our own. We think, okay, if I really bear down and work hard and really focus I can overcome this on my own. How's that going for you? Right? No matter how disciplined we might be, we, we still struggle. And I love that God has given us so many different types of help in our battles against temptation. He's given us one another. And He's given us accountability. And He's given us prayer. And He's given us, he's given us the Word. Right? Psalm 119, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word helps us in this battle. But I'm guessing many of you have used all of these methods to overcome sin, and yet you're still struggling some. Could it be that we're missing out on a key piece of the puzzle in helping us to overcome sin? And maybe that key piece of the puzzle, I missed mix that one up. Didn't I? Maybe that key piece of the puzzle is the Holy Spirit started this series last week, Forgotten God, a series about the Holy Spirit, and we said last week, listen, we cannot determine what we believe about the Holy Spirit based on fear of what other people are doing or what other people might think about us. We've got to base our beliefs about the Holy Spirit based on the Word of God, right? 
I'm not worried about what other people are thinking about this series. We just want to base our beliefs on what the, on what the scripture says. And so last week we studied Ephesians chapter 3 and specifically we zoomed in on this verse. Verse 19 that says, according to Paul's prayer, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And so we said, great, great news. If the Holy Spirit lives in us, he's not just a retired author that helped write the scripture and now he's, he's gone, he's not doing anything. No, he is still active in the life of Christians today. And in this case in particular, it's very clear what the Spirit does, right? The Holy Spirit lives in you to give you inner strength. We said last week, we all need that. Like we need inner strength to survive the difficulties and challenges of this life. But maybe for some of you, if you've never really thought about what the Holy Spirit does in your life right now, or nobody's ever, you've never thought through this, it's hard for you to believe. It's hard for you to believe that the Holy Spirit could be doing something for you right now, today. But we said, based on Ephesians chapter 1 last week, that you have to believe it to see it. As Paul prays in chapter 1 of Ephesians, he says, you've got to have the eyes of your heart enlightened our spiritual eyes have to be open to the realities of what scripture teaches for us to see God's work in our lives to see his strengthening power on the inside I need all the help I can get now when it comes to temptation as we said maybe maybe there's some more help than we sometimes given God credit for maybe there's there's something else maybe the Holy Spirit is meant to help us in these battles now this is, and I've shown a chart like this before where we talk about this, pro it's a lot of words on the screen I get, but imagine down here at the, the bottom is when you're lost and then immediately, not immediately, but when you're saved, there's that star up there where you're saved, you're justified, you're victorious, and at baptism, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And sometimes we kind of stop right there and say, okay, well that's, that's it, and then it's my job to kind of follow this this line this diagonal line up to the the end of time and so it's just this constant uphill battle and it's up and down and there's struggles and we think sometimes this growth in holiness or sanctification that's just on me right I got to get her done and do the hard work and grow as a Christian and then this the battles I face with sin I've got to do it well maybe maybe there's more to it than that maybe maybe the Holy Spirit all along was intended by God to help us in this battle against sin and in this growth process through our lives. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Our scripture reading came from there this morning. And we're going to start at the beginning of the chapter, but I guess before we start at the beginning of the chapter, will you go back to a couple pages to chapter 3 of Romans? We kind of have to get an idea of what's going on Romans in Romans to understand what's going on in chapter 8. So you go back to chapter 3. And we're just going to pick up in verse 21, right? Just a couple of verses from chapter 3 to give us an idea of what's going on in Romans. So chapter 3, verse 21. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. All of the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. How is it that we can be saved or declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ? He says it's not through the law. It's through faith in Jesus Christ, right? He says in verse 23, for all of sin, for there's no distinction, into verse 22, verse 23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ whom God put, put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Beautiful description of what happens for us in Jesus Christ. So it's faith in Jesus that saves us, not a, a list of works. They're not works of the law. And so what I want you to see is, and then skip to verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the point of Romans is to say, listen, we are justified, we are made righteous, not by our own goodness, but by faith in Jesus Christ. It's a really simple explanation of what Romans is about, which can be kind of complicated. With that in mind, skip to chapter 8 now. So based on all of that, you are righteous by faith in Jesus, he says in chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore, so therefore, based on everything we've said about righteousness through faith in Jesus, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Good news, if you are in Christ, you stand before God uncondemned. Isn't that, isn't that great news? We deserve to be condemned. We're all of sin, chapter 3, verse 23. We deserve death. But because we're in Christ, we stand before God uncondemned. 
Now, what does that mean for us? How should we live? Well, look in verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Now, look at verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So if we are in Christ and uncondemned before God, we are to walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Now here's what's happened for, for every Christian. It's really easy to be drawn into the ways of the flesh, isn't it? It's really easy to see all the things going on around us, all of the fleshly temptations that surround us, and say, I just want a little bit of that. But what happens when you want just a little bit of the flesh? You soon want a little bit more of it, don't you? And before you know it, you're kind of engulfed in the ways of the flesh. And so verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Here's what this looks like. Have you ever been distracted by something that wasn't necessarily bad in and of itself? But pretty soon, you didn't just think about that thing. That thing kind of controlled your mind. It engulfed your mind. You had set your mind on some fleshly thing like comfort or money or food or sex or control. Like all of these fleshly things that, that God created for us to enjoy. But boy, when you set your mind on those things, pretty soon they consume your mind and now how are you living? You've set your mind and you're living according to the things of the flesh, not the things according to the Spirit. So we're called to live according to the things of the Spirit. So look at verse 6. What happens, here's the question, what happens when you let fleshly things consume your mind? To set the mind on the flesh, verse 6, is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we say, God, help us. We don't want to be people who've set our minds on the flesh and therefore do not please God and therefore will die. Like spiritual death is the result of setting our minds on things of the flesh, allowing our minds to be consumed by that. So what do we do? How do we become people who've set our mind on things of the Spirit? Well, he answers the question, doesn't he? Look at verses 9 through 11. Check this out. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. How do you ensure that you're a person who's not consumed by the things of the flesh? You remember, oh yeah, the Spirit lives in me, so I'm going to be a person who's focused on the things of the Spirit. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, but if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of, is life because of righteousness. Now listen to this. Here's this kind of conclusion. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Good news. Like we have life because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. So we're not people who are focused on the things of, of the flesh people who are focused on things of the spirit so what's that look like next couple of verses verse 12 so then brothers we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh and then you've got this line that we've kind of already heard already in verse 13 for if you live according to the flesh you will die we've established that already right if you let your mind be set on fleshly things and be consumed by them eventually it's going to lead to spiritual death all right so we got that settled but look at the rest of the verse but if by the Spirit, that he just said dwells in us, right? If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So it's kind of, kind of wordy. So think about another translation. The, today's NIV, the TNIV says this. It says, but by the Spirit's power, you can put to death the sins you commit, then you will live. What's that phrase, put to death, mean? That's the same word found in Matthew chapter 26 when it says the Pharisees and the religious leaders were seeking people who would lie about Jesus so that they might put him to death. What are they trying to do to Jesus? Kill him, right? So the language here is you are to kill sin in your life, right? 
How can you do that? How is it that we kill sin? And usually we say, well, we do it by prayer and accountability and by filling our hearts with the word of God. Absolutely. But if there's help there that I need, if there's help there that I wasn't aware about, I want all the help I can get. Listen to what this verse says. It says that it's by the spirit that we kill sin in our lives. Here's the simple, simplified version of this. By the spirit, you can kill sin. Now you say, okay, Matt, that's, that's fine, but... He's talking about the Word of God, right? The Spirit-inspired Word of God. Well, like we said last week, Paul knows the difference between the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And if he wants to say that the Word of God helps us to overcome sin, he can and he will, and he does at times talk about the power of the Word, the sword of the Spirit, not the Spirit himself. There's a difference between the sword of the Spirit and the Spirit. And here he just says it's the Spirit or by the Spirit that we're able to overcome or kill sin in our lives. Which means when you go into battle with sin, you are not alone. Because it is by the power of the Spirit that we can overcome sin. You say, well, Matt, I don't understand exactly how that works. I don't either. But if Scripture tells me that He does, that the Spirit helps me, then I'm going to choose to believe it. Because I need all the help that I can get when it comes to overcoming sin. By the Spirit, we kill sin. Now, do you have a part to play in this? Yeah, it says you Put to death the deeds of the body. You kill sin, but not on your own. It's by the help of the Spirit or by the power of the Spirit. I guess it was last week I told you about going to uh, Glacier National Park. It was the first time I'd ever been to a park where I saw a sign like this. Had never been somewhere where all of a sudden it's like you're entering grizzly country. And if I'm honest, when I first saw that sign, I thought, ah, that's a little bit overboard, right? I mean, this is, come on. Not really. We're not, I mean... Sure, but we're not going to run into a grizzly bear. Chill out a little bit. And they got the little bear spray sign, like if you're going out hiking, take some bear spray. And we saw that sign. We had kind of gone on this little short hike. It was evening, later in the evening. And so then we, on our way back to uh, where we were staying, there were several cars parked in the road. And about 50 feet off the road were three grizzly bears. And then I realized, oh, wait, there are really grizzly bears here. Like, this is, this is not a joke. And so we had some big hikes planned the next day, and Charlotte said, listen, if you're taking me and the kids on this hike, you're going to get some bear spray. And I kind of rolled my eyes and was like, ah, whatever, fine. So we bought some bear spray, and I was playing kind of tough, but I'm kind of glad we had some bear spray, right? Because if we, uh, turns out there are grizzly bears there. Now, some of you who are really tough, like, oh, you don't need no bear spray. Well, yeah, you're also the ones who are carrying pistols with you everywhere you go, right? So it's easy for you to say, you don't need any bear spray. I didn't have a pistol on me, so yeah, I wanted some bear spray. And I'm glad I had, I'm glad I had some bear spray because going into grizzly country with my family, I don't want to go into that alone, right? Isn't it good to know that as we battle against sin, we're not going into battle with sin alone. Now, you say, well, of course not. We've got our church family. That's awesome, but I don't take my church family everywhere I go. We're, we're all, there are some days that you feel mightily alone, don't you? Especially when we're battling temptation. Good news, the Holy Spirit is with you every day wherever you go in your battle with sin. And he's the reason that you can overcome sin. You're not in this battle alone. And so I came with, up with a, a cheesy rhyme. Like I said, this is a repeat of a series we did four years ago. So maybe you remember my rhyme. Probably not. It's not great. But hey, if it'll help you remember, we'll go for it. Here it is. You can't win against sin without the Holy Spirit within. Pretty good, right? Pretty, I should be a poet. I'm a poet and didn't know it. You can't win against sin without the Holy Spirit within. We need the Spirit's presence, and we need His help in this battle with sin. And these aren't my words. Romans 8, this is, this is Paul who says it's by the power of the Spirit that you kill sin. Now, I get that you might say, well, well, what's that look like? And I don't know exactly. Kind of what I imagine is this. Instead of saying, when I'm tempted and a, a thought comes to mind that helps me overcome that sin, we're easy, we quickly say, well, that's just my conscience. Well, couldn't we say that's the Spirit? That's the Spirit reminding me and, and prodding me of, of ideas and thoughts that will help me avoid sin. And so it's the Spirit living within me that, that helps me to overcome sin. It's by His power. Now still you're left asking, okay, well, that's great. We could just stop here and say, this is good news. How? How, how do we allow the Spirit to work in our lives in this way? And the simplest way to say it is just like this. We've, well, yeah, I'll go back to here. You know, this, this pathway of this 
uphill climb and the, the path of life, great news. The Holy Spirit helps you with this, right? But I come back to this question and say, okay, how do I do this? And I think the simple answer is this. We've got to cultivate an environment for the Spirit to work. For the Spirit to help me to overcome sin, I've, I'm a part of the process, right? Again, Romans 8 verse 13 says, you kill sin by the power of the Spirit. So I'm involved in this. How can I, how can I cultivate an environment for the Spirit to work in my life? You understand that in, if you're planting anything, right, you got to have the right environment. Brother Danny's a great gardener, right? I was thinking the right, I was about to say a planter. He plants things and it grows, right? That's good. When I plant things, they don't usually grow very well. We struggle with this a little bit around our house. Several years ago, um, I got the idea that I was going to have buy a rhododendron. They had rhododendron at the, um, the big nursery in South Jackson. Uh, and so they had a rhododendron, and that's special to me because a rhododendron is the state flower of West Virginia. And I saw it, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have a rhododendron in my yard because West Virginia and all. I was real proud. So I planted that thing and watered it every day, and it took about three months until it looked like that. <laughs> Don't laugh at my plants, man. The great thing is, at this particular nursery, nursery, you can take it back and get your money's money back. I probably didn't say um, this was my fault. Here's what happened here. I planted, I thought I was doing the right thing, but I planted it in our front, front yard, and there, we have a couple small trees. There's no shade. It's in the sun all day long. Turns out, rhododendron does not grow in the sun. You got, it's in the mountains, in the shade, in the hills, and all that kind of stuff. It just didn't work because I did not cultivate the right environment for it. If the Spirit is going to work in our lives, we've got to cultivate the right environment for Him to work in our lives. How do we do that? A couple of things. Number one, daily repentance. This is daily acknowledging my sin and my struggle with sin and my desire to turn around and go the other way. Sin's not going to go away. I'm going to keep struggling. But this is, this is acknowledging my struggle. And I would say this is more than just acknowledging daily my struggle and my need for God and His help. It's trying to search out the root causes of my sin. Let's imagine that out here in the parking lot afterwards that somebody, one of you pulls out in front of me. And it's not a big deal, but I kind of hit my brakes. And then I roll down my window and I scream at you. I mean, I scream. I don't, I don't cuss at you, but I scream at you. And I give it to you. When all that's said and done, you would say, uh, Matt probably sinned by screaming at a brother or sister in Christ in the parking lot after church. And you would be right. Now, I could say, oh, I'm really sorry about that. Is the root problem there, bad drivers irritate me? No, if I am losing my temper in that way on a regular basis, there's something going on deeper than just bad drivers irritate me, right? There's something I need to deal with in my heart. And if the Spirit is going to help me overcome sin, then I would say the Spirit probably helps us in this discovery and thinking through and praying about the things that are going on on the inside. So daily repentance, number two, it's going to take daily belief. It's going to take saying, okay, so scripture tells me that the spirit lives in me. He strengthens me in my inner being and he's going to help me overcome sin. I need that reminder daily that I'm not on my own. Just preparing for this sermon series has been the consistent reminder that I need to be reminded daily. Oh, wait, I'm not on my own. I've got the spirit. There's so much strength that can be, can be gained just by believing what scripture says, and daily reminding myself, I'm not on my own, I'm not on my own, I'm not on my own. The Spirit lives in me to help me with this. But I think we also, to cultivate the right environment for the Spirit to work, we need to pray deeply. You know the difference between a shallow prayer and a deep prayer. Now, God hears all of our prayers, but maybe the shallow prayer is the prayer that we pray before lunchtime today, right? We're hungry, and it's kind of a quick, we acknowledge, we thank God for what He's given us. But when we say deep prayer we're talking about the, the the alone prayers when we are begging God for help and we're asking God to to stamp out the temptations in our lives and help us to overcome this it takes deep thoughtful heart level prayers about the things that we're struggling with if we're going to cultivate an environment for the spirit to work and connected to that we need to pray in detail about our most consistent sins think about those two or three things that that you struggle with the most but there's a long list. We could go to the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, right? And think about all those different areas that we might struggle in. That doesn't even include everything. Those two or three things. Now, I think it's easy to stop here and just think about the big stuff, right? Lust or greed or something like that. Well, what about like 
jealousy or gossip or some of those things that we kind of are, are maybe we feel as if they're kind of lower level what about those sins when was the last time you prayed deeply about the sins that you struggle with the most if we're going to cultivate an environment for the spirit to work i've got to pray in detail about my most consistent sins and then i think we've got to really worship god with our hearts to cultivate this environment which means when we gather on sunday and do what we've done this morning that prepares us like like Nathan was talking about in the lord's supper when we think about jesus and the lord's supper and when we when we're really worshiping with our hearts i walk out of here encouraged and on fire and and helped cultivated my heart is cultivated for the spirit to work you say is there really a, a connection between the spirit and worship well you know ephesians 5 19 you could quote it right addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to, to the lord with your heart you know what's right before that we'll talk about this verse next week verse 18 we don't refer to verse 18 as much but be filled with the spirit and then it's addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Turns out that when our, our lives are filled with the Spirit and His fruit, that leads to more heartfelt, heart-deep worship. And I think it's circular because when heart-deep worship is a part of our weekly rhythm or even daily rhythm, what's that? The new, that allows us, the Spirit, to have even more reign in our lives. Because we're making room for Him even through our worship. And so I would challenge you, when you gather with God's people, when we're gathered on Sundays, and Wednesdays for a singing night. Really, worship with your heart. And watch how God uses that time of worship to prepare your heart for the Spirit to work. And then last, just be expectant. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. ESV has a little footnote that says holiness. So God's will for my life is holiness. Let's, let's add the pieces together. So God's will for my life is holiness. Romans chapter 8 says that this, by the power of the Spirit we can kill sin, so we have the Spirit's help. If I were to pray to God, God, please use your Spirit that lives inside of me to overcome sin and be more holy. If God's will for my life is holiness and He's promised that the Spirit will help me, don't you think that's a prayer that God would delight in answering? Don't you think He wants to help us overcome sin? And so therefore, if he wants that for me, if that's his will for my life, and it's provided the tools that I need to do this, then wow, I'm just going to be expectant that God is going to do that because that's what his word promises. I want to be expectant, and I want to cultivate an environment for the spirit to work. So this morning, here's, here's what I want you to hear. As you think about your battles with sin and your struggles, know that you're not alone. You've got a church family, you've got the word of God, you've got prayer, but good news, wherever you go, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you to help you kill sin. You can't win against sin without the Holy Spirit within. Really, when we talk about all of this, when we talk about culti cultivating an environment for this to happen, we're just talking about the position of our hearts. And a different, a different word to use besides cultivation is positioning. We're positioning our hearts so that the Spirit can work in our lives, so He can help us to overcome sin. You know the value of, of positioning, right? You want to put this in the right place for you to be successful this fall, right? It matters, doesn't it? I don't know a whole lot about it, but I've heard you put one of these in the right place. You put a, any sort of birdhouse uh, in the right place. Birds, you do it the right way, like positioning matters, and, and birds will start showing up in your yard. Go figure. I, again, I don't know anything about it. I mean, it's that time of year. Does positioning matter here? <laughs> Your team, my team, gave up some touchdowns yesterday because people were not in the right place, right? You want to you win, you want to be successful in about anything, positioning matters. If we want to win in this battle against sin, turns out we've got the help. We've just got to position our hearts. And God will delight in answering our prayers and helping us to overcome sin. Why? Because you can't win against sin without the Holy Spirit within if there's anything we can do at all today to help you in your battle against sin, or if we can help you in the, the beginning steps of your relationship with God so that you might be baptized into Christ, so that you'll receive the Holy Spirit within, we would love to do that while we stand and sing together.